What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 20 of the Chat It Up podcast. If this is your first time listening in, uh, Chat It Up is a podcast about all things Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And if you're a return listener, welcome back. Uh, I've got another great episode for you guys this week. And once again, I find myself in an awesome mood because my beloved Michigan State Spartans beat Michigan again last night in basketball uh, to complete a sweep of their regular season series. It also gave Michigan State a share of the Big Ten Championship with Purdue. So uh, now they've got the Big Ten Tournament coming up this next week, so we'll see how that plays out. But at least for the next few days, I've got a really, really, really big smile on my face. (laughs) Okay, so let's jump right into episode 20. I want to talk about a pretty special experience that I had recently. Uh, Some of you may or may not know, I published a book in 2015 called Why is for Youper. Uh, It's a rhyming ABC book that's got words, objects, and places that are all, you know, a part of the Upper Peninsula. Uh, Anyways, on Friday, uh, this past Friday, March 8th, uh, I took a ride over to Gladstone to visit Cameron Elementary School. And the reason for my visit was I was invited there by their school and their PTO um, as a guest author for March's Reading Month. And I have to give a big, huge shout out uh, to my high school classmate, Angie, who's on the PTO there. Uh, She is really the person who set the whole thing up. So Angie, if you're listening in, uh, thank you again for for setting this up. Um, I spent nearly the whole day at the school reading my book to groups of students. And we had it set up really cool where there was a projector that projected the book up onto a really big screen so the kids could see it better. And... I had a lapel mic so I could walk around and interact with the students while I read, and it was just an absolute blast. And the other cool thing was a lot of the the students and the staff at the school dressed up for the day. So they had on their flannels and their plaid and their blaze orange or their stormy chromer gear. I mean, you name it, they were decked out. Um, the other really cool thing was is when they gave me a tour of the school, Outside of a bunch of the classrooms, there was all sorts of different art projects and different things that related to Why is for Youper and and reading related and March's reading month. So I thought that was super awesome. It was just a really, really great day. And it's really kind of wild to take a step back and look at the bigger picture of like the impact that Why is for Youper has had. You know, when I wrote it four years ago, I was just a guy writing a book that I thought was fun. I never really like imagine sitting in front of 400 plus students and and reading the book or seeing art related to it or having kids track me down in the hallway to sign autographs for them you know I'm I'm very much just a normal everyday guy so when I have these types of experiences it's just very very surreal Um, but at the end of the day I think the part that makes me the most proud is the fact that the book is helping promote literacy with kids And even four years later, um, you know, the book is still putting smiles on people's faces, both young people and old people. That's pretty special. So, uh, you know, I'm just really, really grateful. And once again, I just want to give a huge, huge, huge thank you to the faculty and the students from Cameron Elementary School over there in Gladstone. The hospitality that they showed me was nothing short of incredible and the school and the people that they have there and the students also are are all just truly, truly special. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. All right. Uh, otherwise, it's time for uh, This Day in Youper History, which is brought to you by the folks at Pasty.com. That's P-A-S-T-Y.com. And also the uh, Pasty Central Facebook page. So uh, here we go with This Day in Youper History. Pasty Central Day in History, March 11th. This is the birthday of the northernmost county in the state of Michigan, the county with the smallest population, and the county which includes Isle Royal within its borders, Keweenaw County, formed on this day in 1861. Four years later, on March 11th, 1865, Grant Township was formed, one of the five townships of Keweenaw County, named after Civil War General Ulysses S. Grant who became the 18th President of the United States in 1869 and whose image first appeared on the $50 bill in 1913. Finally, on this day in 1967, 
the state of Michigan acquired its first helicopter from Instrum Corporation, built in the UP near the shores of Lake Michigan in the city of Menominee. Pasty Central Day in History, March 11th. Okay, another big thank you to the folks over at Pasty.com and the Pasty Central Facebook page for bringing us this day in Uper history. So this week, I sat down with Miss Anna Dravlin for my interview. Anna is the creator of Spread Goodness Day, which is coming up on Friday, March 15th. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the commercials that have been running on TV6, or maybe you've seen their social media stuff that's out there. I've known Anna for a few years, but I would really only call it surface level, so to speak. Um, We typically would only kind of see each other at networking events, things of that nature, just maybe on social media. But uh, she has an absolutely incredible story to tell. So I'm going to just jump right into this. So without further ado, let's chat it up. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Anna Dravlin. Anna, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So we'll just kind of jump right into things here. I know that you're a born and raised Uber, correct? Yes. Okay. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your background of growing up in the UP? Uh, well, I was I was born in Market General, but okay. uh, I grew up in Nagani All right. um, and lived most of my childhood there until sure. we about sixteen. Uh, and I have I have six brothers and a sister. I was going to say I have down here that you have a pretty big family. I do, and um, so I'm the seventh of eight children. Uh, <laughs> so there was a certain amount of like chaos and activity growing up and. My parents were awesome in the way that they really wanted us to all be involved as, in whatever way, in whatever we wanted to be involved in. Sure. Um, so we were all in sports and doing everything we wanted to do within reason. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Are you? Is what's the age range as far as like oldest to youngest? I mean, is it? It was pretty stacked. It was. Okay. Um, Eight kids in 13 years. So wow. Oldest, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. stacked for sure. <laughs> like the oldest is. Uh, let's see. She's. You have to deal with my brain pain too. So, um, how old am I? I'm 35. She's she's 45, and the okay. youngest is 32. Oh, okay. So right. um, sure. it really was very, very compact, and we were very most of us very close in age. And so it had to be pretty like fun or interesting, just having that many kids like coming and going. I mean, yes. I mean, you mentioned kind of the craziness, but I don't think people really truly appreciate unless they have like a big family. No, I don't think there's any way, even like my parents and I, like we, we laugh sometimes because we like, it's all kind of a big blur for the most part. Like there's things that happen that they don't even know about and we'll tell <laughs> stories and they'll be like, please stop telling us stories. Yeah. Um, Cause it like, and we were all really active and like playful. So it sure. wasn't like we were the kids that were like, you know, being a little too noisy, we were like playing hockey in the living room on rollerblades <laughs> and smashing pucks into the wall. Like, so it was very like it was very energetic and chaotic and wild. Um, sure. But it was really it was also really amazing to have that many people um, kind of to keep you playing and engaged. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that's a pretty unique experience. Not everybody has a very big family <laughs> yes. or that type of thing. So it's certainly kind of special to your story. Um, speaking of your story, I know you graduated from Gwynn in 2001, right? Yes. And then you kind of moved to a lot of different cities. I did. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? I mean, I'm interested um, to, to kind of learn about that. I was a little bit of a wandering fool. Um, sure. I didn't want to go to college. Mm-hmm. I was really, really sick of the school setting. And I um, immediately, once I graduated, I spent, um, I don't remember if it was the first year or the second year after college or after high school, but I... Went to Mackinac. I met met a friend that was from Mackinac, and I went down there for a summer, and that kind of was a fun, easy thing to do. So I spent several summers going back and forth from there and here. Mm -hmm. And then I've always really loved heat and the the (laughs) south, so um, uh, I knew I was going to end up in the south. So at some point, I moved to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I was uh, 23. And I just, I would waitress. It was, it's really easy to just go to and fro waitressing. Nobody's ever that upset to lose you. Right, um, sure. You're very replaceable. <laughs> uh, and it was a decent living for a young girl, um, relatively. <laughs> <laughs> there is a reason I went back to college. Sure. Um, but so uh, then I went to North Carolina, which did about a year and a half there, and that didn't work out the way I planned. Mm-hmm. Came home for about nine months, went to Arizona. 
uh, for an, to live with another friend. Um, it was it was really just I really wanted to explore. I wanted to see what else was out there, and I, I think just like anybody that's actually like from here, when you leave, you start to realize like why it's so special here. Um, it was very, very awesome to see other places, and there's things that I love about everywhere I've lived. But um, everywhere I went, I was like, this isn't right. Sure. <laughs> this is not how you're supposed to be. <laughs> um, so then that la- the last round of it, I after while well, I was finishing college, I. Um, I finished school in Detroit. Um, oh, okay. I got a job sure. at the Fox Theater and Limpy Entertainment and the Joe. Very cool. Yeah. So I was like, well, I guess I have to finish school in Detroit because you can't turn that job down. No. I, I'm, I would imagine you probably saw some pretty cool gigs to come through there. <laughs> so fun. Yeah. Like Prince um, oh, was man. the coolest one. I actually managed to get tickets to one of his last shows. Oh, wow. And it was very neat for me to know, like, the, you know, when they were loading in all the stuff and the little requ- requisition lists that they send to our booking teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does give you a different perspective of the events. Sure. And I got exposed to, like, the entire region of Detroit because I, I was doing sales and promotions. So sure. my audience was anybody that could buy an, a ticket. Yeah, yeah, I um, suppose. <laughs> so it was everything from, like, the very kind of, if you want to say, like, the lower end of things mm-hmm. all the way to uh, the kind of the upper crust Sure. <laughs> side of things, um, because everybody was my audience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everybody wants to go to the show. So, you were working and going to school at the same time. Now, were you going to school for kind of like that hospitality management type of thing, or what exactly? It were, I mean, did it yeah. fit with with your job, so to speak? I actually, I had a really awesome progression in okay. my decisions as far as my career. Like, I really went back to school very angrily. <laughs> um, I was like, fine, I'll get a two year degree so I can get a stupid management job, and blah blah blah. I just didn't put put a lot of value in school because I had a lot of negative experiences with it with like high school. Sure. Because it wasn't the right setting for me. So when I went back, I changed my approach and said, this is how I have to do it. I'm going to mm-hmm. sit in the back. I'm not going to pay attention. I'm going to leave the class whenever I want to because I am very antsy. And I just told the teachers that. I was like, don't don't be disrespected. This is how I have to learn. Mm-hmm. And uh, somewhere in the middle of all this, instead of wanting to get a management job, I started volunteering. Okay. Um, I decided I was going to get my edges for Superior Edge uh, sure. at a Northern there. And mm-hmm. um all of a sudden, like the event world sort of opened up to me. Um, I was volunteering and doing fundraisers for events and just going and getting donations. And then sure. it started to be on committees for events. And mm-hmm. then I started getting job offers for events. <laughs> uh, and that's where my uh, career kind of just naturally moved into because sure. that's what I was, I was doing in all of my free time. I sort of, sort of fell in love with it um, as soon as it started. Um, fundraising is the coolest thing ever because if you make more money than you spent, you always did it right. Absolutely. Um, and it's so much fun to like get people happy to give their money away. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love hearing how people kind of find their way into something that they're passionate yeah. about because everybody's is always kind of unique to them. There's never two that are the same. Um, Absolutely. So now you mentioned kind of moving back up this way and kind of making that transition to get back here. Wh- I mean, walk me through that a little bit. What was it so much about this place that you love that kind of kept drawing you you back to to the UP? There's a couple of things, definitely. The last round in Detroit, like, it was so fantastic and entertaining and different. And um, I got experiences that, mm-hmm. like, I'm pretty sure many people will never get um they're very unique and one of a kind and um but you know it was very this isn't to say anything negative about Detroit necessarily but it is different and it is more of a intense situation as far as your safety Mm -hmm. so that was one of the factors as you know I it was very overwhelming to have to kind of live by a lot of different rules because you're not there's there's places that you're not safe sure um so that I'm not used to that being here, you yeah. know. We all kind of just roam all over. <laughs> and the other thing was, once uh, I was in school and working full time, um, I mean, I didn't have any time, none. I sure. was th- that was one of the hardest things I did. Um, and I asked people, "Where can I go to be alone? I need to be alone." And they're like, "Go to the park." 
And I was like, what did you just say? <laughs> and I was like, no, like I need to be alone. I need some woods. I need some shoreline or something. Sure. And all, you know, a lot of it was very uh, limited access. Um, mm -hmm. And there's not really the same, like being alone here is a different thing than being alone somewhere else. Like sure. I can go five minutes in any direction here and really be alone. True, <laughs> very, um, very true. <laughs> like this, we have m so many miles of shoreline that any day that I want to, if I want to be alone on the beach, I can be alone on a beach. Yes. Um, and <laughs> things like that that I just didn't even realize were like almost necessary to my happiness. Mm -hmm. um, once I was landlocked from it all um, and just surrounded, I, I just knew I needed to go home. I've heard that from a lot of people that I know that either went to school downstate, depending on where they went, or living closer to Detroit, that mm -hmm. they miss water. So much. Uh, you, you don't realize what draw and sort of pull that lakes have, not necessarily just the big lake, but just lakes in general. Down there, you sometimes you have to travel an hour or two in any direction just yes. to get to a lake, that type of thing. And, and you might not be able to swim in it. Yeah. Like, yeah. It might not be safe. I know. Um, so you you kind of talked a little bit about once you, you got back up here and volunteering and, and fundraising and how that kind of snowballed into job offers and such. So I want to kind of fast forward a little bit to then that really kind of led to you working for Travel Marquette in 2016, right? It did. Can you talk a little bit about what you were doing for Travel Marquette? Um, I, when that job listing went up, I was the general manager at the Up North Lodge, mm -hmm. which was also really neat, but it wasn't the career for me mm -hmm. and uh, I looked at the job description because two people sent it to me mm -hmm. um, the morning they posted it and I was like this is my job yeah. I was like I do all those things for fun <laughs> um, so I just I just told people it's my job there's nobody else that can have it uh, and I told the director at the time that in the interview um, and uh, it was community relations and event marketing was sure. what I went in with mm -hmm. but it definitely um, really developed very quickly into a lot of different things. Sure. <laughs> um, so as, as jobs tend to do sometimes. It, it did, and it was really wonderful. Like, I, I miss my job, like, more than anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't even explain. So I did, um, fundamentally, my core of my job was to uh, manage our sponsorship program for mm -hmm. events and help uh, manage and um, as a, act as a consultant. Act, act, act as a consultant for uh, events that we sponsor. Mm -hmm. uh, communicate with them. Make sure they get all the you know get all our assets from them. Sure. Uh, as well as um, managing the radio program, uh, communicating with different event committees, that kind of thing. And it did turn out to be, I ended up managing a lot of the public relations. Uh, so when travel mark or when the travel. When the Travel Channel came into town, sure. I set up their itineraries oh, and okay. I hosted them and took them all over town. That's super neat. Um, it was so fun. <laughs> um, so when D Jeff Daniels was filming, I was the front caravan. Oh, and, great. Um, I was like, oh gosh, I hope that I don't do anything <laughs> stupid. Um, and so uh, I ended up being a media guide uh, and being managing a lot of the itineraries for media that was coming in and hosting mm -hmm. them. Uh, we, and it just, uh, so there was... Uh, and then I did a lot of the media, I did a lot of the interviews and mm -hmm. community engagement here. So yeah. I was present, very, very present in a lot of uh, different organizations, clubs, meetings, just trying to keep a pulse on the community and make sure I'm sharing it in the best possible way and that our events got the best possible outcomes. Excellent. Um, I, and that, I find that to be super interesting just for me kind of personally I love watching the travel channel and I love kind of that side of things and Marquette's just become such a destination so yes. to to know that so much media and different people are kind of like flocking here and to then kind of have at least like your thumb a little bit on the pulse of that I just I find that super interesting it, it was very interesting and just some of it was like a lot of it that comes as random only a very very few um, what you hear about is actually planned sure um, and, and you know and agreed upon mm -hmm. um, but it is super fascinating to be the person that's kind of poking at the people that are talking like because I know that they're getting their content from a lot of different sources 
um, once they get to me, they've already got the background, they've got you know information, they've done their research. Mm -hmm. Once they get to me, it's like the last kind of taste of it. Sure. Um, so it's just reinforcing how good it feels to be here. Yeah. Um, and that was a really cool part of being behind the camera. Well, they plan. We've already planned everything. Now right. it's just they have to love it the same way we do. <laughs> and they they do. The thing that I heard the most, and I loved it, is that they were so surprised when they got here. Um, people come from China, from Chicago, from California, uh, all over the country and the world, and they would be like, I did not expect this. <laughs> be like, I know, isn't it awesome? <laughs> so to fast forward a little bit, I just want to jump to a date that I'm sure you'll never forget, November 16th of 2017. How did I know that was the day? Well... <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty big day in your life, and, and I know um, I appreciate you kind of sharing your story with me, because I know it's not something that's really easy to talk about um, for you, um, but can you kind of walk through what happened on November 16th of 2017? Yeah, it's, um, and it's, it's not the worst thing to talk about anymore. Like, as it gets further away, it doesn't hurt as much. It just feels surreal. Like, it definitely feels real, um, but it's... Telling the story feels surreal. Like, the, is this really my story? Mm -hmm. um, so I, it actually had started three weeks before that date. I had hit my head, mm -hmm. um, and I had gotten knocked out, and I believed I had a concussion. But I was very stubborn. I didn't have insurance, so I was like, "Well, I'm not going to the hospital unless my head explodes." Right. Um, and it's like, if ever there were some famous last words. <laughs> um, the pain got increasingly worse um, in the week before the the actual accident, and uh, I got up for work that morning, and it was just blinding. I don't think there's any way for anybody to explain the worst pain they've ever felt in their life. Mm -hmm. I started texting my mother and just tr trying not to let her panic because she was driving home that day from Lansing. Sure. But I was concerned and scared. Yeah. And, uh, I just told her my vision was doing something funny and my neck hurt so badly I couldn't think. Mm -hmm. um, and she suggested a massage and I didn't think that, I was just said, that this isn't a massage. I don't know what this is. Um, and I, I decided not to walk my dog, which is unheard of. I, I, I walk my <laughs> dog every single day before work and um, I couldn't. Um, I had, the only option there was go to sleep or get to work and get a little bit done before you come home because it was a busy day sure. uh, that day. And so I was just going to like get through the morning. And I left my house and I got about a, about a half a block away. Um, I was walking because I didn't live far, far from my job. And uh, all of a sudden, like the best I can describe it is that it's like somebody like flipped some switches in my brain and everything dropped out of my hands. Um, my vision went out in my left eye and I just crumpled straight to the ground. Um, and it wasn't like a, like a hard fall. It was just like a slow marionette doll style, like just crumpled to the ground mm -hmm. and then just stared at my hands. And then just, it just became sort of a desperate few minutes of like, how do I get help? Sure. Um, and you don't think clearly. Your brain's not functioning. So mm -hmm. I can didn't think of picking up my phone. I just was looking around, and there was nobody. And it was... Um, I'm sure very scary. It was. Because I, 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 it's like I knew that something was really bad and serious, but I also didn't didn't mm -hmm. I like I still you know, like you just don't know until you know that it's mm -hmm. bad yeah um, and then I saw this blue car coming and I literally I ever I took everything inside me to try to stand up I knew that I was just like I have to stand up I can't I have whatever I do I have to get up I have to think I have to get up that was on repeat in my head and um, this blue car was coming and it's the only car I saw so I tried to throw myself at it because that's a good choice. <laughs> um, but I just knew that I, I needed somebody to find me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it didn't work. Um, she didn't see me, and I fell down again. And I watched her drive away. And, and I literally remember like that sinking feeling in my gut of, oh, God, 
I'm alone. She's, she didn't see me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I remember looking at her car in the rear view, or not or like her rear, yeah. you know, and then she just stopped. And then all of a sudden this lady was running at me. Um, and I remember her, she was, I, I just grew, like was grabbing her and I couldn't talk. Um, and I still didn't even understand that I couldn't talk completely. I, sure. It's like, I did, but then some, it would come in and out. Mm -hmm. um, and then she uh, could hear her describing everything I was wearing to the ambulance. And like the things, that's when things started to really just that like kind of settle in. And it felt fast and slow at the same time. And I listened to her say, yes, she's dressed appropriately. She's wearing boots and a hat and a coat. She can't talk. She's this. She, um, and I just laid there. And I, <sighs> um, it was really fast. They, they, I was only a mile from the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so they got somebody there really, really fast. And I remember here... Her saying to me that he, the am, do you hear that? That's the ambulance. They're coming for you. Mm -hmm. They're gonna help you. And I that's when I just started sobbing. Of course. And because I didn't want to pay for an ambulance. Oh yeah. <laughs> Seriously, like I actually said, I don't I don't have insurance, and like uh -huh. I just realized that whatever, like it goes twofold. I realized that what was happening was serious, mm -hmm. and whenever you have a serious injury, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. Of course. So it was like twofold, like crap. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening to me, and how much is it going to cost me to fix it? Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I didn't really realize that it was like a death thing. Like I didn't know I was like fighting for my life at that. Of moment. course, yeah. So you ended up you were in the hospital for probably what nineteen or twenty days, right? Mm -hmm. Nineteen days. So what exactly, I guess, then when when you got to the hospital and they finally checked you out and went through everything, what was like the final prognosis of, of what exactly had happened? That is such a hard. Thing. It's there's no clarity to it really. It actually took several months after the stroke for them to say clearly this was the cause of your stroke. Sure. Um, but. Um, all things said and done, um, when I hit my head in the original injury and with the concussion, my internal carotid artery started to tear. Oh, geez. And uh, as it tore, two little blood clots formed trying to heal the injury. Mm -hmm. And then three weeks later, when the actual, it fully tore and those two clots released and the blood flow in my brain stopped because oh, the artery collapsed. Okay. So it, it had it found blood, collateral blood flow, mm -hmm. um, but they had to get the clot buster. They call it the clot buster. Right. Um, and I'm sure there's a formal name for it, <laughs> but they yell, "You need a clot buster in the ER." <laughs> um, and uh, so it was actually like three injuries. Mm. I had the concussion and yep. the original tear, and then when it fully tore, that caused the stroke. Wow, that's unbelievable. It really is. <laughs> like, like, well, you know, it is what it is, though. We're like, anything that you hear about, like, car accidents, things like that, they're just accidents. Sure. They're just what, it's just what happened. Yeah. Um, well, and, you know, you kind of mentioned a little bit, you're worried about, like, you don't have insurance, you don't want to ride in the ambulance. So it's like, obviously, this is a life-changing event for you. From that moment on, everything changes, but at the same time, at a certain point, it's like, okay, you head home, but you still have to live your life, right? I mean, yeah. how do you, I mean, can you kind of walk me through what that's been like since, since the accident? I mean, I know it hasn't been super easy. That is still the hardest thing to comprehend and, like, deal with mentally and physically mm -hmm. is that... Um, I've had some other extreme circumstances, and in my recovery sure. that have, have taken away from my recovery but um, it is it is very very hard to learn to live with a new brain sure. um, there is a hole in my brain there's a scar that is never going to be the same mm -hmm. once it heals it heals and to 
the recovery itself, like, it, I was so happy the day they said I could leave. Mm -hmm. And then that same day I had the worst panic attack that I'd had in a while because as soon as I put my shoes on and started to, like, relieve that, like, that you know, that safety nest of doctors of course, and yeah. medication and people making food for you all the time. And right. um, it was like, am I actually ready? Mm -hmm. Am I safe? Am I going to die? Because um, it leaves you with almost like a permanent... Anytime you have an instant life-changing injury like that, mm -hmm. it does leave you with a fear of it happening again. Um, because it, it's, it's scary. Yeah. Like, I, so that's a, you know? It's a very rational um, fear. You know, a lot of times people talk about irrational fear, but that's an extremely rational yeah. fear. I, I feel like anybody that would... Can relate to or be in your shoes after having something traumatic happen I feel like would feel very similar to that yeah I think that one of the hardest things has been navigating even like the healthcare system and learning about my stroke recovery because first first thing is that every stroke is different mm -hmm. somebody could have the same type of stroke of me as me and they could have they could die or they could go back to work in a month sure. um, there's such a spectrum of, of damage that can be done um, that there's no way to really look at recovery in the same way for any patient. Um, and the aftercare and instructions is can be confusing for a long time unless you really have a lot of money to get somebody to invest into your education and, and long-term care. I went back to the emergency room a lot in those first six months, and really in, in the last year and a half for, for a lot of various problems. But... Um, because they would keep saying just that standard, um, come back if you feel numbness or weakness. Mm -hmm. Well, I had numbness and weakness like every week. Sure. <laughs> um, and it took about six months and a trip to U of M to learn that I'm, I'm always going to have numbness and weakness on the right side because mm -hmm. um, I was paralyzed on the right side. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, when I get sick or tired or overwhelmed, it gets much, much worse. So I didn't know that. So every time the numbness would come back, I'd freak out and go to the ER. Sure. Because that was my instructions. Mm -hmm. So some, sometimes nav navigating the healthcare systems and their rules and their expectations and their standards has been one of the hardest things that I feel like is a barrier to real care and feeling secure in my body. Sure. Um, and then just... There's no guidebook. Like, I never, I don't get to know any day of the week how things are going to go. Um, when I went back to work, I really, I really thought when all this started, I was going to be able to go back to work. I, at least I was trying. Mm -hmm. And um, not when all of it started, like, within, you know, a few weeks. Right. And I was like, <laughs> I have to go back to work. This is my job. Of course. Um, you don't know until you try. And it's very heartbreaking every time you try and you can't. Like everybody says, there is no, you know, there's no try, just do. And it's like, you don't understand brain injuries. <laughs> um, because it's impossible. Like some things, like I can, um, sometimes if you, like when I'm talking about something that's natural to me, I'm very communicative and comfortable. Sure. But if you asked me to think in a, into a detailed anything that's not natural to me, I can't communicate. Like, I can't get words out of my mouth. I can't get things to go from my brain to my mouth. Um, I can't do paperwork the same way. I can't, sure. I can't feel my right hand. Like I said, I can't type. Um, there's just such a spectrum. And then there's the, and then there's the roller coaster. It's the, uh, you, I might be great for a month and great by my standards, you know, but start to feel almost normal and be like, woo. Yeah. And then, and then the downslide will hit, and I'll be bad for a month or a week or two sure. weeks. Hills and, and valleys. It's very confusing and hard to manage and balance. Mm -hmm. Like, am, am I going too far, or am I do I need to slow down, or I need to back up, or is this just how it is? Do I not want to back up and keep pushing so that I don't get too stagnant? It's a very, it's a very hard balance, and I'm a very like I'm a very intense person like mm -hmm. I before this I was go 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 all the time and it's I don't know how I don't know how to live right now so I 
like and full honestly like I'm still in recovery I'm still doing different therapies sure and I'm still in a difficult place with it mm -hmm. it's there's the the good tears and the bad tears sure and we, we know that they are both uh, present fairly regularly <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> well and I'm glad that you kind of talked a little bit about the good tears um, because as is kind of always it seems like in the UP when things happen you know bad things happen it seems like the community always rallies and the community has really rallied around you can you talk a little bit about kind of how people kind of come came together to help you out I could talk about it for days <laughs> I've started to because my memory is really poor so I've started to verbally dictate into a recorder I'm trying to remember all these crazy things that have happened and beautiful things that have happened so that someday when I'm a little more stable and less less to figure out, I can properly write about this and tell people about this because it's magic to me. Like I don't even fully understand. I, I do. I, I know. I, I, that's a lie. I completely understand the capacity this community has to just want to be there for each other. Um, from the time I had the stroke. I came, I came cognitive about three days after the stroke. I don't okay. remember anything sure. for that. But as soon as I started coming awake, I had flowers upon flowers upon flowers and cards coming to my, my door. One of, one, of my, um, one of my board members actually sent me four cards in the hospital. Wow. It was so cute. Sure. Um, <laughs> like, so there was just there was flowers everywhere, little, little gifts coming from little business owners, from individuals, shop owners, executives. It was, it was overwhelming because it was the hardest time of my entire life, and I was so swallowed up with love. Mm -hmm. that it was beautiful like I could see like I'm gonna cry like <laughs> like I'm tearing up a little bit because you don't there's just there's no way to describe how awful it is and how hard it is but to to be going through that and to have the community literally just bombarding you with love and support mm -hmm. um, in the hospital initially it was great but the real crazy things happened after I left sure people started we were confused we were behind my family we were like hour by hour and um we'd be like oh crap it's snowing we have to get a shovel yeah and somebody would show up with a shovel like and without us ever leaving to go to the store mm -hmm. um then it snowed and we have to we have to plow um and before we even thought about plowing somebody showed up and said we're gonna plow for you all this winter yeah um People bring food, like Tom Wallstrom, you know, called me and says, "I'm going to make you food. What are your allergies?" Wow. Um, people making me food, bringing me food, shoveling. They built me um, a railing and a staircase, um, and that was just the initial recovery. Like, what's it's blown me away even further is how much support they've given me in the year and a half. Yeah, I can't. Like, I could I could talk about it forever. Um, strangers come up to me all the time and hug me and have, and have handed me cash. Wow. Um, I'll go... Sensei, there's a burger truck outside um, I will go to the food co-op mm -hmm. to get food and somebody will have left a gift card for me and not signed it and said just from somebody from the community who cares. Wow. Um, the, the assistance with housing. I'm actually living with someone right now that was a stranger to me until she found out I didn't have any place to live. Um, and now I'm living in her house <laughs> temporarily, but it's, sure. I, I can't really wrap my head around it all the way sometimes. And I am fascinated sometimes that people care this much like mm -hmm. about me, you know, sure. you're just like, why are they doing this for me? Yeah. Um, and I do, I do know why, because this is what I did before. I, and I did it for other people because it feels good. Mm -hmm. And it, it's awesome to help people. And there's nothing more satisfying to a lot of people to, than to make a difference in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. um, so even whether they know me or strangers and whether I deserve it or not, um, people gave more than I could have really 
dreamed of and not just money you know they sure. were giving their energy and their time and their their attention sure. they were being very thoughtful about the things they provided for me well and that's kind of a great segue into I feel like you kind of paying it back tenfold out into the community and beyond with uh, Spread Goodness Day. Yeah. So, you know, March 9th of last year was your first Spread Goodness Day. For those who are unaware, can you kind of explain what Spread Goodness Day is and where where all of this kind of came from? Yeah, so this is where it kind of gets a little magical, almost a little for me, is like this is something that I've been working on for eight or nine years. Uh, I had different ideas about Spread Goodness Day, the restaurant, or this or that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, with my background and what I wanted from it, I just wanted it to be a day. Mm -hmm. Uh, And one day to show people the power they have to change the world every single day with simple actions. Um, So it became Spread Goodness Day. Um, As an event planner myself, I knew that when you plan something and you can concentrate energy into, if if I can concentrate energy into one day, you can show impact. Sure. Um, And so I decided that this is it. Like, I'm not saying don't spread goodness every day. I'm just saying let's talk about it a little more. Let's celebrate a little bit more this day to show us, show it just show people how powerful you are yeah absolutely we we literally every action we take every day is powerful um and i don't like the idea that we 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 kind of put ourselves into a position of uselessness or less power than we have in a time that they they might feel a little bit like they don't make a difference and that's just i just disagree so i'm gonna combat combat that message (laughs) um and it actually (laughs) I, I, bl- I planned everything and I built my platforms and I got the website up and I got everything done mm-hmm. um, with, with help. You know, I had a, some people helping me at that point. Um, sure. And I launched everything on October 28th of 2017. And then it was literally two weeks later that I had the stroke. And it was, I mean, almost a little bit hilarious. I'm literally barely able to speak and I'm paralyzed. And I'm crying because I can't do my Spread Goodness Day event. <laughs> because it's meant so much to me for so long, and it became something real to me, and I I was ready sure. for it. And I felt like it was being taken away from me, just like, you know, just like my body and my life and my job. And Sure. Um, I didn't want it taken away from me. Yeah. So um, I didn't let it (laughs) no you didn't let it not at all and you know it now we're we're coming up here on the second year of it coming up here so um which will be this upcoming friday um as at least to when this podcast comes out it'll be the the upcoming friday and uh, so part of your kind of trademark for this has been your sunglasses. Do you want to you want to touch yes. a little bit about uh, about the shades? I find it like completely ironic because like uh, I we got this tagline of the future is so bright you're going to need shades. Yeah. Um, and I did that before the stroke, and now I have to wear shades like all the time. <laughs> so it's, like you just can't write this stuff. No, it's um, very serendipitous. And I'll never I'll never run out of shades either. <laughs> Um, so yeah, as we built the brand, I just like uh, I wanted. I love the I love the sun. I love the energy of the sun. I wanted what everything we do to feel energetic sure. and warm. Um, so uh, as a friend was walking on the beach with me, she kind of thought of the sunglasses, and I was like, "Yes, this is perfect." <laughs> and it and it has been. It's perfect. There's something that I've noticed as I because I just give these away for free as much as I can. Um, they are for sale, but. As a promotional item, I love giving them away. Sure. And I love seeing the, the smiles on people's faces when they put them on. Um, it's pretty consistent and weird. I, <laughs> I love it. Uh, we went to the Jacob Eddy Center to film the promo um, this year, and we got about 50 veterans, you know, you know, all older folks. Yeah. And they put on these sunglasses. Some of them couldn't even see. And they were just looking around, smiling <laughs> so big. Yeah. Um, just because the idea of it and like the just connecting with it um, made them happy. Uh, I love that. It was. It's been wonderful. So um, yes, I have these wonderful custom shades that we give away every <laughs> year, and it's because all of this goodness we're going to spread is Absolutely. making the future so so bright. 
Speaking of all the goodness that you're going to spread, do you know how many acts of kindness you've we've ha- you've had so far? Is there any sort of tally or I an have, estimate? I have received information that's exceeding the thousands already. Okay. That's um, pretty special. So, like, I the only people reporting to me right now are some of the people that are like planning. Mm-hmm. Promote promotable events. Yeah, a lot of people do surprise sneaky stuff. Yeah, they do. So I didn't f- find out about anything last year, mostly until well, I found out a lot about things in advance last year, but things just blew up that day. Yeah, um, it was. Have you heard coolest. of any big stuff for this year that's coming up? I did. There's some really cool stuff happening. There's um, uh, Eagle Mine is giving out Lego kits to kids around oh, town. That's cool. Um, Select Realty is doing a Spread Goodness Day um, celebration zone event. Okay. So they're um, they're giving they're going to have they're going to have two hundred pairs of sunglasses available. We're going to be doing video logs with Bennett Media mm-hmm. uh, and photography with um, Bethany Vaughn, so people can video log how they did good that day or how they received good. Sure. It'll be a little fundraiser for my organization. Um, there's going to be cookies and treats. Jerry Mills is going to be singing down there. Oh wow. Um, there might. Be be some cheerleaders I'm not really sure but it's gonna get weird and fun um, so it's really um, kind of sharing the goodness uh, together um, we've got the kids club uh, child development center is gonna be there's 100 kids and they're gonna be passing around 500 little gift bags they've made um, in the last few weeks so That's it's gonna be a hundred little kids running around with five little gift bags each to pass out to whoever they want that's fun um, one of the other ones I really love is the um, uh, Connect Marquette. They're yep. doing their um, Every Kid Deserves a Birthday Bash. They are, yeah, I did see that. That is so cute, very, very cute and sweet. And it is. the thing that I learned with that one after last year is you, you think about the children with that event. Mm-hmm. Um, yay, they get a birthday bag. It's cake and candles. Literally, they're families that can't afford cake, right? Sure. Um, and what it actually does too is gives the parents the ability to give their kids a birthday, mm-hmm. and that is even more powerful. I just um, so the the re- the residual effect is really intense and amazing. Um, Teresa Sell from Encore Financial is doing a, a spread goodness day surprise, Ooh. and that's going to be really fun. I'm going to go <laughs> along with her for a part of the day. Um, so that's uh, let's see. Honestly, I could tell That's a lot. Forever. I mean, yeah, you, you could. So um, if somebody wanted to kind of get involved or kind of follow along with all of this stuff, you have a few different avenues, right? You've got a Facebook page, right? Just spread goodness day they could look yes. up. What are some of the other ways that they could kind of find you out there, I guess, um, so to speak? Well, look up spread goodness day pretty much across the board. That's our email address, our website. Sure. Um, we're on Instagram, uh, the social media uh, and feel free to reach out via email if you want to learn more about it or um, find out how you can get more involved. Sure. Um, it's very much a, a young organization. We are a 501c3 now. <laughs> oh, that's so, great. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited to see how things can develop and what kind of team can be built. It's still, I love that it's still so young that like a lot of new ideas and um, visions are very open and welcome. There's, there's still so much potential um, that it's, Amazing. Um, I, I I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there anything else that you wanted to add about? I mean, we um, we've covered a lot of I stuff, but the only thing I just definitely want to add is that like none of this with Spread Goodness Day could possibly happen without of the without the incredible, incredible, insane, overwhelming support I get um, because I have brain damage. Mm-hmm. I can't do things the same way I used to, and it stinks. Like <laughs> I know how to do this. This is this was my career, sure, and I can't do it anymore. Yeah, and I I can, but I need a lot of help. So, and I've got it. I like I'm I'm completely like upside down, like confused, excited about how many different companies and organizations are are working with me and for me. Like Bennett Media, like particularly, I just have to give them love because sure. they. I called them uh, a few months before the event last year, and I was all stroke tastic, and just was like, "I would like some help. I have no money, and I had a stroke." <laughs> and they're like, "Okay, come on over," and they had, they really embraced it for their like from across the organization, and they're now like a pretty full partner, presenting partner. They're they're putting 
so many hours and so much of their own energy into this to make sure I have something that is professional and really gets the message across. Um, Because we know how important it is to be able to have a a look and a sound and a feel that people actually can connect with. Sure. And they actually gave me that. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm active with them Mm -hmm. in the process, but... um, and between the, the the media stations, TV six, and everybody, like I couldn't do it. It, it wouldn't get so big without everybody do it, like helping me. And it it's definitely has no possibility of being anything unless mm-hmm. everybody does goodness that day. Sure. So my one final question, which if you've listened to the podcast before, and I know you have, you know the question that's coming. How do you like your pasty? I like my pasty with with ketchup. Okay. I do. I Good. just like I like I just. Little, little bit on the side to dip every bite in. Okay. Unless I'm feeling wild, and then I just squirt it all okay. over. Okay. There you go. Just dig in. It's interesting the different answers I've gotten across the board because I feel like you kind of learn about people's personalities a little bit just based off of like literally how you like your pasty. Which... I think I feel like I have to go back and like listen to all of your podcasts now just to figure out how everybody wants their pasty. Yeah, and um, I, I, I kind of had done a pasty chart of who had said what at first but then now I've done so many more episodes I kind of need to go back to that I feel like I need to make like an Excel sh- spreadsheet of of people's choices and such but um, is ketchup a common it very much so yes <laughs> point of enjoyment <laughs> it is it definitely is probably the most common so awesome all right Anna well I can't thank you enough for for coming on the podcast and sharing your story and as kind of a quick little sidebar it's definitely a story that I, I sympathize with my my grandmother had a stroke at almost the same age as you um, hers was a case of a misdiagnosis of a blood clot where they were putting her on blood thickening instead of blood thinners oh, no. and so yeah so she ended up paralyzed on her uh, I think it was her left side um, but yeah she was paralyzed for the rest of her life on one side and so as you're kind of telling this story to me I, I'm kind of reliving my my childhood you know helping out my grandmother with a lot of different things so it sticks with you it does. it does it's not something you forget once you've experienced it or you've been had a close family that you've had to watch figure it out sure all right. Well, again, like I said, thank you for coming on and, yes, and sharing you. your story. And like you said, the the sad tears and the happy tears. And yeah. it's it's really awesome. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's time for the takeaways from my chat with Anna. The first one is resiliency. Anna has faced more adversity in one year than many people face in their entire lifetime. And she's done so with a combination of both strength and grace. I have to say, I actually, I admire her very much for how she's taken a, obviously a very negative event in her life and she's working every single day to turn it into a positive. Youpers are tough people by nature and I would almost go so far as to say that it's ingrained in our DNA, but Anna's a living, breathing definition of that. I also know that we all go through our own battles and struggles, so whatever it is that you're going through out there, just keep going. Don't give up. My second takeaway from our chat is a pretty obvious one, and that's spreading goodness. So often when tragedy strikes, we see our communities step up and we help each other in times of need, and now with Spread Goodness Day... Anna has kind of created her own way to give back and what's so incredible about it is is there's no reason to spread goodness other than putting a smile on someone's face. So my challenge for everyone listening to this is to participate in Spread Goodness Day coming up on Friday, March 15th. Because if we all do our part to spread goodness, just imagine the ripple effect it could have on our communities around the Upper Peninsula and also far beyond. Chat It Up is a bi-weekly podcast about all things Upper Peninsula of Michigan. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe, rate, and leave me a review. You can also find Chat It Up on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for listening in. I'm your host, Shooter, reminding you to keep your chin up and your eyes forward. <laughs>